Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts. As we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. And the power. And the glory. Forever and ever. Amen. Amen. So there's this Sunday school teacher, and she asked her class about the meaning of Easter. One child raised his hand and said, that's when we shoot off firecrackers and celebrate our freedom. And one little girl said, no, that's when we eat turkey and give thanks. I know, another child said, that's when Jesus comes out of the tomb. But if he sees his shadow, he goes back in. <laughs> One of the interesting things about this holiday is, is that for us as believers, this is, I think, the most significant day of the year because we are remembering the resurrection of Jesus. Amen. We're the only religion, by the way, that believes that our founder, our leader, is actually still alive. Amen. Most religions, that's not true. that's true. But in the world, there's a lot of misunderstanding. A lot of wondering or trying to make this into something maybe that it's not. Celebrating life in a certain way, but we're not celebrating just life in general. We're celebrating the fact that a little over 2,000 years ago, a man died, was buried, and then rose again to new life. And that's just different than ever. I mean, nobody, I mean, really, if somebody, if I came to you and said, yes, last Friday I died and went in a tomb and here I am standing before you this morning, you wouldn't really buy into it. The reality is resurrection doesn't happen very often. In fact, only happened once. Permanent. So this morning, what we're going to do is spend some time talking or reading through a passage of Scripture where 2,000 years ago, the Apostle Paul was writing to a church, and this church was apparently having some misunderstandings about the resurrection. Well, what does all this stuff mean? What, is, what does it matter? Things like that. And so I'm going to read a lot of the Bible today, like 700 verses. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not doing that. But it's going to speak. No, I won't even feel it. You're going to be so interested by it that it's just going to come. So if you have your Bible and you want to look, we're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And we're going to read through it. And then I will just, we'll just talk about how important the resurrection is. Last week, when we talked about Palm Sunday, we talked about how important the cross is. Because the cross is important. The forgiveness that that provides, the grace that that shows. But... Today is the resurrection, which makes everything that we talked about last week, it completes it. Lots of people have died for other people over the course of history. But only one rose from the dead. Permanently. 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 1, says this. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. As we go through this chapter, Paul's going to return to that idea about vain, empty. If you believe in something that's not true, then you're wasting your time. You all could be home right now, sleeping in. You could be out to brunch. You could be eating an Easter bunny, a chocolate Easter bunny. I mean, there's lots of things you could be doing rather than sitting there listening to me talk, right? Some of you are thinking, yeah, you're right, Pastor. Maybe I should get no, I don't want to, I'm just, I, I could, do, you don't know this, but as pastors, they teach us how to read minds. I can tell what you do. But the reality is, is that he's, Paul's saying is, without the gospel, which is the cross and the resurrection, the reality is, we would all be wasting our time. This would be nonsense. 
It, it would be, your faith would be in vain. And so this is where he starts with this story here. The resurrection is important. Now this is what he's going to say in verse 3. For what I receive, I pass on to you as of first importance. Or as I like to say, as, a, as the main thing. That Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. That he was buried. That he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve. So Paul says, here's the gospel. You want to know what the gospel is? First importance, the only thing that matters, the foundation on which everything is built. Jesus died. He was put in the tomb. And he rose again three days later. And people saw him. Now when we talk about the resurrection, we're going to talk about it a little bit more in a minute about what that exactly means. But just start with the understanding that we're not talking about some spiritual or something where Jesus wasn't a ghost. His spirit didn't come to people. No, people saw him. They touched him. They ate with him. He touched them. They were interacting with a person. Not with a spirit, not with a ghost, not with a, some idea. No, this was a person who died and then rose again. As Christians, as followers of Jesus, we believe this. Amen. 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 Three of us believe this. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm just picking on you. But no, there's, this, this is the foundation for it. A lot of times as we do kind of run into Christians who think, well, Christianity is really about loving your neighbor, or it's about, about some feeling good, about sharing things, about giving to the poor. I mean, there's other things, but what Paul says is this is the main thing. This is it. This is what makes us Christians. This is what makes uh, what we believe strength, uh, help us and strengthen us. Going on in verse 6, he says, he, in verse 5, he had said that he appeared to Cephas, and the Cephas is uh, the other name for Peter. So Peter, and then to the twelve. And then in verse 6, it says, after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time. Most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Fallen asleep there means they died. Then he appeared to James, who's his brother. Then to all the apostles, all these other people. And last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. So Paul said, I saw, not in the, just a vision or dream, I saw the physical form of Jesus. If you add up all those numbers in there, there's a lot of, and I'm not going to do the math today, but there's, he says 500, and then he lists 12, and then he says four apostles, and he says, so over 500 people saw Jesus walking around on the earth. Not a spirit, not a ghost. They saw this person who had died and was buried, and now he's walking around talking to people, touching them, they're touching him. It actually physically happened. It wasn't just a magic trick, it was a resurrection, a bodily, physical resurrection. Verse 11, we're going to skip some of the subjects because he kind of goes off into a little testimony here, but I want to orient more on the resurrection. So verse 11 says, whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believe. This is what makes us brothers and sisters in faith. Because we believe the same thing. This is a requirement. You have to believe that Jesus died and rose again in order to be a follower of Christ. That's where it starts. This is what we preach. This is what you believe. This is what we do. To, this is what makes, no matter what else we do, what kind of music we like, what translation of the Bible we read, even what day we worship on, all of those things are secondary because the only thing that's important is, is that do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins? And then rose again a few days later. That's the that's the foundation of the whole thing, and it's everybody. So I want to start off by saying this is not Paul's gospel. The resurrection of Jesus is preached by all the apostles. So it's for all. It's all of us. 
That's why we can sit here in this little town on the coast of Oregon and celebrate and rejoice in the resurrection of Jesus while at the same time people on the East Coast, people in South America, people in Asia, people in Africa, doesn't matter where we are in the world, we are all brothers and sisters in Christ because this is what binds us together. This is the main thing. I haven't said this for a while. I'm only saying this because Eric's here, but because he, this is his favorite thing. But this is, this is that. There you go. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. That's the, yeah. See, see, they know it, right? We know it. So this is the, this is, the, that's why today, and this last past week, is the most important time for us as Christians. Yes. Because this is when we remember these things and focus on these things. So this is what we're going to do. Now, we're going to go, now, this, it's really weird because a lot of times we think of the old church, like those people back there that Paul preached to, they're all saints and their faith is strong and they understood everything there was to know about, and, and you know what? Look at what verse 12 says. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? See, sometimes we think those kinds of questions came up just recently. <laughs> no, right from the very beginning, people were saying, well, the resurrection, I don't know. Yeah, I know, Paul, you saw him, and Peter saw him, and all those other apostles, and five, over 500 people saw him, and they're all saying they see Jesus. But you know, really? Really? Resurrection? I don't know. That seems like a step. That's, that's hard to believe, right? And, but that's true from right from the beginning. It wasn't something that everybody just bought into. Why? Because people then understood that dead people don't come back to life. They don't. Unless God does something to re-resurrect that person. And so there are people at the time, Paul says, who are preaching that there is no resurrection. Now they're primarily talking about, as we're going to see in a minute, they're primarily talking about us, that we don't rise from the dead. But Paul's going to say, well, if we don't, then that means Jesus doesn't either. And then we're back to, well, let's see what he says in verse 13. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead, but he did not raise him, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. He's going to keep saying that, by the way, until you get it. <laughs> And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. That's right. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. And there are people in this world who look at us and they pity us. <laughs> because we, in their minds, we're believing in something that's a waste of time. It's not true. In fact, not only that, but I'm standing up here before you, and I'm lying through my teeth because, and I'm misleading you or whatever. This is, this is what people who don't believe in Christ think of you all sitting here on a sometimes sunny, sometimes rainy <laughs> Sunday morning, but when you could be doing other things. Look at the word he uses, useless, uh, pity, uh, pitiful. In fact, if there is no resurrection of Jesus, then our faith is, according to Paul, useless, futile, and pitiful, since it is based on a false faith. That's why we have to believe that Jesus rose from the dead. Because if not, none of this matters. None of this is, makes any difference. That's why the resurrection is important. Because a lot, some people do believe, well, Jesus, yeah, he, can, he gave his life for us, and I get the sacrifice, and he paid the penalty for sin. But if there's nothing after that, then 
That means the sacrifice wasn't accepted by God, and if it's not accepted by God, then we can't apply it to ourselves, and as Paul says, we're still in our sins. Our problem hasn't been fixed. The problem is still there. And so we're faced with that. So, we're going to uh, just stop for a second and say that the, when we think about the resurrection, there are three things that um, are, are, are evidence that the resurrection is real. Okay? So the resurrection of Jesus is based on, one, it's based on the teaching of Scripture about the character and promises of God. That's one of the things that we, when we've been going through the minor prophets, that's one of the things that we see. That God, when he judges sin, there's something after that. There's restoration. There's forgiveness. That's the way God acts. That's the way God does things. And so when we think about the resurrection, it's consistent with who God is and what God has promised us. The second thing is the thing that Paul talks about, which is the testimony of eyewitnesses. You have to basically say, if reason I don't think that Jesus rose from the dead is because all these people misunderstood what was going on. Or, even worse, lied about what was going on. But we have to just look at it and say, well, Paul says, you can go, he wrote, he wrote this, you can go talk to people who have seen Jesus. There are eyewitnesses. People have seen this. So not only is it just about God's character, but also about the testimony of people who actually were there and saw what happened. And then the third thing is, which has changed lives of multitudes of people. I did not ask Bill to say what he said earlier, okay? But it's consistent with what I'm saying. Amen. When you see people like Bill and you see his life changed, you say, wow, something's going on there, right? There's, some, there's evidence that God is actually in the business of resurrecting people, of seeing people, of forgiving people. And so when we see those changed lives, that's another evidence. It's not the only evidence. Those other things are important too. Yeah, primarily the, um, the, one of the problems with, if we just base it on the changed lives is, people can then say, oh well yeah, it works for you, but that doesn't mean it will work for me. But when we go back and say, no, scripture talks about the character of God, and that God promises to do this for you too, if you put your faith in him. The, those eyewitnesses, they saw it. It is true. This person rose from the dead. Now you add that to the testimonies that people have, you realize we have at least three reasons why we can say, no, the resurrection actually happened. Because we see it happening. We, they saw it happening. We then preach it. We say, this is true. You can rely on this. You can... If you can get past the miracle aspect of it, and if you really believe in who God is and what God says, then the resurrection makes perfect sense. Mm, and it works. So and we are not pitiful, useless, or futile. No. Faith works. Yes. It works because it's true. <laughs> because it all actually happened. In verse 20 of Corinthians, he goes on to say, But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Talking about the resurrection here, about our resurrection. We die now, and, and we go to heaven to be with Christ, to be with God. But someday Jesus comes back, and when he does, we are all resurrected in the same way that Jesus was. Mm -hmm. Physically, bodily resurrected. Good news is, not in the body that you generally have right now, the better one, like <laughs> Jesus was, but it's a bodily resurrection. That's what Paul's talking about. It's not necessarily, I mean, he talks in other places about be our spirit going to be with God when we die, but he's anticipating the time when we will all be able to physically touch each other, we will eat together, we will live together in a body with Jesus. And that will all happen someday. 
And he, and he says, because the resurrection actually foreshadows that. And so the first fruits is the idea that when you first start to harvest, you take some of that fruit and you give it to God. Why? Because you're anticipating there's going to be more. And that God's going to continue to provide. And that's what Paul says. That's what just Jesus' death is. Jesus' death is a first fruit. It's the way God says, look, here's the first. Now the rest of you are going to come later. So, if there is no rest, oh wait, I gotta read verse 24, sorry. I get, sometimes I get anxious and get jumping ahead and can, can get, get kind of, um, um, just get so excited about things that I just get going on. So, verses <clears throat> 24, it says this Then the end will come when he stands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be defeated or destroyed is death. For he has put everything under his feet. Now when it says that everything has been put under him, it is clear that this does not include God himself who put everything under Christ. When he had done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him, so that God may be all in all. And some of the songs that we... Well, part of the resurrection is this idea that Jesus has rose from the dead, and now he is the king over all things. He reigns. We, we read that, we, or we sang that this morning. about he, The resurrection is a demonstration that God does reign, even over death. Death is the final enemy to be defeated. So, when we talk about this resurrection, if, if there is no resurrection of Jesus, then we have no hope for our own resurrection. That's what Paul's saying. First, we're wasting our time. Our faith is useless, futile. But secondly, there's no hope. There's nothing to look forward to. There's nothing beyond this. Because if there is no resurrection, then Jesus hasn't been raised. If Jesus hasn't been raised, we won't be raised either. We face eternity, nothing for eternity basically. So there's this um, story about some fellows who were uh, stationed in Korea during the Korean War, and while there they hired a local boy to cook and clean for them. Uh, being a bunch of jokesters, these guys soon took advantage of the boy's night bed. They smeared Vaseline on the stove handle so that when he turned the stove on in the morning, he'd get grease all over his fingers. They put little water buckets over the door so that he'd get deluged when he opened the door. They even nailed his shoes to the floor during the night. Day after day, the little fellow took the brunt of the practical jokes without saying anything. No blame, no self-pity, no temper tantrums. Finally, the men felt guilty about what they were doing. So they sat down with him and said, look, we know these pranks aren't funny anymore, and we're sorry. We're never going to take advantage of you again. That seemed too good to be to this boy, so he said, no more sticky on the stove, he asked. <laughs> nope. No more water over the door? Nope. No more nail shoes to the floor? Nope. Okay, the boy said. No more spit and soup. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that, if there's, if, if, as we look forward to the resurrection, is really the idea that that's what kind of what we're left with is just getting revenge on people, just treating people wrongly. Because if there's no resurrection, what difference does it make what I do in this world? What, how, what, what, I can be mean to people, I can, I can treat people wrongly, I can just go out and be selfish and get everything that I want for myself. There's no resurrection, there's nothing after this. So why, what, 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 why wouldn't I, in fact, do that? And so that's what Paul turns to next in verse 29. He says, now, if there is no resurrection, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized for them? And as for us, why do we endanger ourselves every hour? I face death every day. Yes, just as surely as I boast about you in Christ Jesus our Lord. If I fought wild beasts in Ephesus with no more than human hopes, what have I gained? 
If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Now, some of you, or as soon as I said baptism of the dead, you stop listening and you're thinking, well, what is that? What's going on with people? Okay, well, the Baptist answer is we're not really sure totally what he's referring to. But in the paragraph that Paul's pointing out here is he's trying to point out that regardless of what that was, you're wasting your time if you're doing it. Because the dead aren't raised. There's no resurrection. It's the same thing with preaching the gospel. I can go out and preach the gospel, particularly going to some foreign land where they kill people, they preach, and where there's persecution. Why do I deal with all of that stuff? I'll just let us eat and drink. Tomorrow we die. Why are we do why are we putting ourselves through all of this stuff that goes on in this world? Forgiving people who then treat us wrongly again. Acting, being, trying to be giving to people, but they just take advantage of it and steal the money. Whatever it is, there's just so much trouble in the world. Isn't it, wouldn't it be better if we just went into our house and just stayed in there, kept everything for ourselves, never shared anything, just keep it? Now, if there's no resurrection, why wouldn't we do that? Why would Paul say, why would I face, he says, he talks about wild animals here, it's, it's um, possible that what he really means is people that have gone kind of crazy on him <laughs> and persecuted him. Um, Ephesus had a big riot while he was there. And they were really, people were getting ready to kill him. And so, so Paul says, why, they, why don't I just go home to Tarsus and just stay there? Why would I go face all this stuff? And why would we do some of the things that we do if there's nothing past here? In fact, this is one of the, this is possibly one of the problems that we have in our world right now, in our country, because people don't believe in the resurrection. They don't believe in God. And all of a sudden, anxiety, selfishness. Shouldn't I just get everything I can get for myself now? If I don't face God, if God isn't rewarding those who put their faith in Him, why would I... Why don't I just go do all these other things? And suddenly we've got divisions and dissensions and arguments and fighting back and forth. And it's going to get worse. Which is why we pray that people would put their faith in God. Amen. Trust Jesus. Because it's really the only way that's going to... Otherwise, it's just going to keep going the wrong way. One way to put it is, is this. If there is no resurrection of Jesus, then our service to God and others is foolish. Yeah. Doesn't make any sense. I started this sermon off by saying, what are you doing here? Sunday mornings would be a lot easier if I could just stay home and watch baseball or football or whatever. Or go play golf. Or go out to breakfast or go, but instead, you give up all of that to come here and listen to this guy standing in front of you and just yammering away and all the stuff that he says. But hopefully you're saying, no, I'm here because I believe in the resurrection and I want what God is offering me. I want what God is doing in my life. I want him to help me with my problems. I want him to heal. I want him to fix my life. I want him to do all those things. And because he has done those things, I give up my mornings to come out and praise God Amen. with these brothers and sisters, yeah. with these people that this has happened to their life yeah. also. Yeah. And so we don't say, let us eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. We can't say, let us eat, drink, for tomorrow, we will be resurrected. <laughs> Let's celebrate that, right? Let's rejoice in that. Let's be happy about all of those things. I was um, reading this uh, description of Jesus, and maybe some of you have heard it before, it's, it's gone around, but this is talking about Jesus. And here's a man who was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. He worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30. And then for three years, he was an itinerant preacher. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never even owned a home. He never had a family. He never went to college. He never put his foot inside a big city until the death. 
He never traveled 200 miles from the place where he was born. He never did one of the things that usually accompany greatness. He had no credentials but himself. He had nothing to do with this world except the naked power of his divine manhood. While still a young man, the tide of popular opinion turned against him. He was turned over to his enemies. He went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves. His executioners gambled for the only piece of property he had on earth while he was dying, and that was his coat. When he was dead, he was taken down and laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. Such was his human life, but he rises from the dead. Yes. You know why we remember Jesus? Because people said he rose from the dead. If it wasn't for the resurrection, none of us probably would have even heard his name. Or just as an obscure person who lived a long time ago. The resurrection is the sign that Jesus, or that God has said, I accept his sacrifice. I know, I, I am approving of this. This is the thing that's going to remember, that you all are going to remember. The resurrection is important. It is part of who we are as followers of Jesus Christ. And it's the main thing, the most important thing. I don't want to get rid of the cross. We've got to have the cross, too. I mean, if all he did was die of old age and then voice from the dead, that would be different. But the cross is only important because of the resurrection. That's the only reason it is. Without the resurrection, there were thousands, millions of people crucified around the time of Christ. But we only remember one of them. Because he rose from the dead. Have I said it enough yet? Yeah, I'm, trying get, I'm trying to use the word resurrection like 14 times in the sermon. Hopefully I did that. Because it's the thing that matters. Jesus at one point was, you know, in his, before his crucifixion, he was talking with a family. And that family was facing the fact that um, their, these two sisters, their brother, had died. And while Jesus, so Jesus shows up after he died, he's already been buried. And Jesus is talking to Martha, one of his sisters. And he says, Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Amen. Jesus point blank says, I'm the resurrection. Do you believe in life after you die? She says yes. But this is the question that Jesus confronts us with. At some point, Many people will look at Jesus and they'll read the Sermon on the Mount or some places and they'll say, well, yeah, he was a good teacher or he was a morally good person. And it's really unfortunate that he got caught up in the politics of the time and was killed. And, but he's just a good teacher, a good moral. And Jesus says, no, I didn't. I got, as true as all that stuff is, it's not what matters. What's, what confronts us all is the realization that this man died for us and then rose again. And Jesus is asking you, I am the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? That's the main thing. It's the most important question that anybody ever faces in their life. Do you believe it? Are you willing to have your life changed? Are you willing to be a different person? Are you willing to anticipate that the things that you do in this world are important? Why? Because you're going to stand before God someday. And God's going to ask you, do you believe this? Did you believe this? Do you want life that I'm offering? Do you want it? That's really what I think faith comes down to. Are you willing to live 
the way that God wants you to, to show that you really do believe it. A lot of times we say, oh yeah, I believe it. Then as soon as you walk out those doors, somehow the world just kind of takes over and you just kind of live the life you've always lived and nothing really changes and everything keeps going. This but believing in something and putting your faith in it means you're saying, yes, God, I want you to change. And I'm willing to do whatever it takes to receive that change, to be that change, to live that new life. Mm -hmm. And that's what Jesus says. Do I have the resurrection of life? Do you believe this? Just want to remind you of the, if there is no resurrection, if there is no resurrection of Jesus, then our service to God and others is foolish. If there is no resurrection of Jesus, then our faith is useless, futile, pitiful, since it is based on falsehood. If there is no resurrection of Jesus, then we have no hope for our own resurrection. But Jesus did rise from the dead. And so our service to God and others is not foolish. In fact, it's the most wise thing any of us could do. If there's no if there is, since Jesus is resurrected, then our faith is our faith is useful. And it's important. And it's it makes us into better people. Thank you, Lord. Because it's based on truth. And if there is and if Jesus is resurrected from the dead, then we have all reason in the world to put our hope in our own resurrection. Amen. 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 Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, I thank you again for your desire to save us, to bring us to yourself. I thank you, Jesus, for being that sacrifice Thank you, Holy Spirit, for teaching us and guiding us in the things that Jesus said. I thank you, God, that you have done everything that you can to bring us to yourself, to give us life after death. And right now, in the, the quietness of the moment, God, I am confronting the people sitting here and myself. Jesus says, I am the resurrection of life. And he says, do you believe this? Maybe this is the first time you've ever been in a situation where you've been just confronted with the understanding that you have to make that choice. You have to put your faith in Jesus. And maybe you're deciding really, oh yeah, I guess this is true. It is something that I need to do. And if that's what you're doing right now, then just pray a prayer, something like this. Heavenly Father, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that he died on the cross for me. I confess my sins to you and ask you to forgive me as you have promised. I commit myself to turning away from my sins and beginning to live a new life of love and obedience to you. Thank you for loving me and giving me eternal life. And Father, as we pray these prayers, or pray these words, and even if We've done it before, and it's, we just are reminded of these things, God. We just realize that your promise is to come live with us, to abide with us, to, to walk with us, to change our lives, to make us into better people. Yes. And so, God, we thank you and praise you for that. You pray these words, and you mean them. God promises to give you new life in this world, and a resurrection in the next. So Father, I thank you for the promises that you've made to us. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the resurrection of Jesus Christ and what it means for us. Father, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.